assert reset. Whoops, if I could type, even better. Okay, so reset, we're only going to hold it high for one clock cycle. Okay, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to wait an additional clock cycle after that just to make sure everything stabilizes. What does that mean? Well, outside of reset in a real world environment, it takes one clock cycle for, you know, it could take several clock cycles, it could even take microseconds for the entire design to see it. So let's just keep with good coding style and wait for the reset to propagate and the reset to be seen and the design to respond to the reset. So what we're going to do here is we're going to now, we're in the clock number two, we're going to drive, whoops, we're going to drive the edge detect signal. And we're going to drive that for, uh, I'd say, a handful of signal, a handful of clocks. But what I want to do is I want to see if, what I want to see is I want to see our positive edge detect sample that, drive it to a drive the pulse high. So we want to say if pulse is not equal to one tick B1, error. Okay. And then this is a starting point for validating it. Okay. Now let's go ahead and let's connect everything up. So un ed sig. We're going to connect the unedge detect signal to the signal port. We're going to connect the clock. We're going to connect the reset B. We're also going to connect pulse. Now you should be asking yourself, wow, you forgot to declare wires and registers, Kyle. What should you be using? Well, let's think about that. If I'm going to be using a procedural block to drive signals, they must be what? Registers. So we're going to say register un edge signal. Reg reset B. And now we got the pulse. We're actually sampling pulse. We're actually taking that from the module. So it's a connecting line. It's actually not being driven inside our test bench. It's being driven by the positive edge detect module. So we say pulse. Okay, we also want to have a clock. A clock needs to be done inside an always block. And I'll show you how we do that. We say clock, we create a register for it. Now we want to go ahead and create something that generates it. So I'm going to do another initial block, begin and end. And I'm going to say clock is equal to zero. And I'm going to create a forever loop. Again, you'll learn about this a little later. You don't need to use any of this. You can actually just use, um, you can actually just go ahead and say, let's make it simpler. Let's just say always. Remember I always said if you, uh, if you put the item you're assigning in the sensitivity list, it'll actually go ahead and it will be it'll cause an infinite loop well that's the goal here we're going to use that to our advantage we're going to say let's create a 10 nanosecond clock and let's assign the inverted value of the clock so what that means here is after 10 nanoseconds we're going to assign clock to be not clock that creates a 10 nanosecond pulse. High, 10 nanosecond pulse, low. 10 nanosecond pulse, high. 10 nanosecond pulse, low. Okay? Um, and so what we're doing here is we're simulating a clock. So let's go ahead and let's compile everything. Again, compile single file, compile all files. Let's see if we made any syntax mistakes. Looks like we did. Oh, it looks like I forgot. Um, the, the quotations, not a problem. Fixed. Looks like everything's good. Now we need to tell the tool that we want to simulate it. So we say simulate, initialize simulation. 
Now it's going to say, I don't know which your top level is, meaning I don't know what part you really want to simulate. Do you want to simulate the PED or the test bench for the PED? I want to simulate the test bench for the PED. So I'm going to expand this and right and select PED TB and say set as top level. Then I'm going to say OK. And now what it does is it goes through an elaboration. It says, OK, I'm going to elaborate the design, meaning evaluate all the compiled components and see if and they actually connect correctly. There is no issues. As you can see, my test bench and my instantiated positive edge detect. Now most of you have done this and you've run into an issue. You said, I cannot look at signals. I, I did a little too fast, my apologies. Well first, let's pull up a waveform. A waveform is kind of funny. It's, it's not done all that well here. So what you have to do is you have to select this little logic signal button. I don't like it. It's just the way the tool works. Um, I'm sure there's a fancier way, but I'm yet to see it. So what I do here is I select this little blue icon here on the left next to the save button. That pulls up a waveform. Now if I go right now and I try to add everything to the waveform, what you're going to get is an error. An error saying this tool was not built for debugging or this design was not built for debugging. What that means is in order to simulate your design fast, in order to emulate your design quickly, they basically get rid of any internal debugging capability. Uh, for us, that's no good. That doesn't do us any good. So what we have to do is we have to reconfigure the tool so that we can enable debugging. So what we do is we go to Design at the top and click Settings. And what we're going to do here is we're going to go down to the Compilation section under Verilog and say Enable Debug. Okay, what that's going to do is allow us to compile the code to have debug visibility. Unfortunately, normal people would think that's more than enough, but it's not. So now we have to go to the simulation section and go to access to design objects. And we're going to turn off limit read access to design objects on the top level only. We want access to everything. We're going to enable access to Verilog registers and Verilog nets that are of more than one bit. We're going to enable read access. Okay, with that that eh, should be good enough, but you know what, just for safety, click these in case in the future you do have something that has read-write capability. You just get into the habit of enabling all this. So let's go ahead and click OK. Now we need to recompile, because what we need to do is we need to build all that information into our model. So what I did is I went here, I said compile all. Now I'm actually going to have to end the simulation. Okay, because what it needs to do is it needs to reload from the beginning. And just for safety, let's go ahead and recompile it again. Now we're going to start that simulation again. Okay, and as you can see now, it looks exactly the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to select all the signals, and we're going to drag them to the waveform. Now they drag nicely. Okay, so what's going to happen is let's just run our simulation for 100 nanoseconds. What you'll see here is that it went really quickly. So let's zoom in and see what we what, what just happened. Um, it looks as if it almost didn't do anything. The question here is, what did it do? Well, let's zoom in. Let's look at it, see if we can't find our clock. Okay, well there we go. Looks like our clock might not be toggling. So let's go ahead and let's examine that. Let's say, let's figure out what's going wrong with our design. So, you know what might be the problem here is something we've talked about earlier. We don't have a time scale defined. So when I say 10, what do I really mean? Okay, what we want to do here is we want to make sure that we got everything defined. So as you see here, 10 nanoseconds. Now, Let's go ahead and let's let's change this code slightly. Let's use a non-blocking. And what that's going to do is cause our simulation to evaluate this in a different order. Let's, what I'm trying to do is trying to seed your mind with the concept of blocking versus non-blocking. And let's also add 
time scale, one nanosecond, one nanosecond. Realistically, we, we know that time scale wasn't the issue, but we want to know that we're truly simulating in the correct time scale. We want to know that when I see 100 nanoseconds, I'm looking at 100 nanoseconds, and that when I say 10, that actually means 10 nanoseconds. So let's compile that. Let's see here. Oh, I, I used the wrong syntax. My apologies. Let's go ahead and uh, just steal from this. It's much easier. There we go. So let's recompile that. Oh, no, I didn't do that, did I? Oh, man. Yes. There we go. I lost my window. There we go. Sorry. Okay. Let's move that back over. My apologies. So I hit save. Yes. I'm saving the waveform. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to recompile. I'm going to do restart. I'm going to type restart. What this says is restart the design. Then I'm going to say run 100 nanoseconds. Well, what do you know? What we see here is that our clock is now toggling. But there seems to be a problem with our pulse. We're driving our signal in, and it's going high, and it's staying high for quite a while, right? But I don't see a pulse. Why is that? Well, what we're looking at here is sort of a, a simulation issue. What we're looking at is, it's kind of a complex problem, but we're going to be talking about simulator schedulers and how they work and how to, how to understand a discrete event simulator. So what you want to do here, to ensure that your signals are assigned at the right time inside the simulation order, inside of a test bench, we have to find our way around a Verilog issue. System Verilog does away with this problem through clocking blocks, but what we need to do is we need to assign all our inputs on our test bench to be non-blocking. What that does is it guarantees that we only assign after the clock edge occurs. It makes it cleaner on your inputs, but again, this is an issue with Verilog and Verilog simulators, and that's why I spend the next week going over discrete event simulators. We'll spend a great deal of time on that. But understand that this is an issue with Verilog and the language itself. System Verilog fixes that, and we'll be discussing that in about two weeks. So let's start that again and see what happens. Let's see if we go restart, and we can just up arrow because we're lazy and we don't like typing and we do run 100 nanoseconds. What do you know here? There's our pulse. Our pulse happens just fine. This is the way we want to test using active HDL. Now what we want to do is, we in the future to expand this, we'd like to remove the input. We'd like to see that it does it, that the pulse does not occur again until I drive the signal high. I'd also like to see if I could send it a half clock signal, you know, one that's only high for half the duration of the clock. Not necessary, but that's a good way to approach the problem. With that, I'm going to stop this tutorial and hope that perhaps this gives you a better insight to how the Active HDL tool works and how to debug your designs. Uh, thanks again.